I don't want to be a product of my environment. I want my environment to be a product of me. It's like you can change up, right? You can say you somebody new. You can give yourself a whole new story. But what came first is who you really are. And what happened before is what really happened. And it don't matter that some fool say different, because the only thing that make you different is what you really do or what you really go through. Like, you know, like all them books in his library. Now, he fronting with all them books. But if we pull one down off the shelf, and none of the pages ever been open. He got all them books, and he ain't read near one of them. Gatsby, he was who he was, and he did what he did. And because he wasn't ready to get real with the story, That shit caught up to him. The fuck was I chasing? It's too wet next for a guy like me. High profile guy. Dead or in a game? Big percent of the time. The thing is, you only got to fuck up once. Be a little slow, be a little late. Just once. And how you ain't gonna never be slow? Never be late. It's life. Yeah. It scares me. All the pieces matter. So this is a video I've been wanting to make for quite a while now. And I've actually avoided making it because I didn't want to screw it up. And I really wanted to think it through, because it is really one of the more grand, discussable aspects of The Wire. Who was right? Stringer or Avon? Who had the right philosophy? It's a bit like Who Whacked Tony at the end of The Sopranos, a video idea I delayed making for a long time before getting around to it, because it's such a huge topic with so many facets, and I'm sure that I'm going to forget to mention something in this video. Oh, and if you're wondering what that weird intro was, I just thought it was interesting how Stringer could be summed up by both D'Angelo's speech in prison and Costello's monologue in The Departed, and the similarity in philosophy between Tony Soprano and Avon Barksdale in that both seem to accept that one day they're going to go down, one way or another. I do plan to expand on these points in future videos. It might also be worth checking out my video Why Did Avon Get Mad at Stringer Over Brother Muzon in Jail before watching this video, as that video is something of a precursor. Anyway, as we know, in The Wire, the Barksdale organisation is run by Avon Barksdale with Stringer Bell, his childhood friend, as his number two. Avon has charisma, swagger, street smarts and a degree of honour, and Stringer has intelligence, pragmatism and a keen sense for business and entrepreneurship, and together they make a great partnership. But then Avon is sent to prison at the end of season 1, leaving Stringer in charge while he looks to find a new wholesaler for his supply after he loses his own. On the outside, Stringer is approached by Eastside rival Proposition Joe for a deal that sees the Barksdales buy from Joe in exchange for territory, setting the stage for what eventually becomes the New Day Co-op, an alliance between the rival drug leaders where they favour diplomacy over violence and turf warfare. Only one heavy hitter wants no part in the co-op, Marlow, and when Avon is released from prison, he and Marlow go to war over corners, bringing heat from the cops and frustration from the co-op. Avon's beefing threatens to destroy everything Stringer worked towards, so he comes up with a plan to send Avon back to jail for a while so he can streamline things in the streets. Meanwhile, Avon also, in a manner of speaking, betrays Stringer by giving him up to brother Muzon, Muzon who wants revenge against Stringer for setting Omar on him. Stringer's Machiavellian web of deceit comes back to bite him when he is killed by both Omar and Muzon, his attempts at reforming the game cut short, and tipping the cops against Avon essentially ends the Barksdale organisation with a whole bunch of guys being sent down. Stringer and Avon both wanted different things from the game. String saw it as a means to an end, a stepping stone. Whereas for Avon, the game was all-encompassing. You gotta think about what we got in this game for, man. Huh? Was it the rep? Was it so our names could ring out on some fucking ghetto street corners, man? Nah, man, there's games beyond the fucking game. And so is posited one of the great questions of the show. Who was in the right between Stringer and Avon? 
The angle I'm approaching this question is not who was the better gangster, who was the better man, who could have won the war with Marlowe, or anything like that. The specific thing I wanted to discuss was their vision for the future, their ideas, their direction for the game. For sure, Stringer lost his way towards the end, and it's easy to argue he lost, because he's dead. Whereas at least Avon is still alive even if he is in prison. David Simon, the creator of the show, has emphasised the point that because of the systems in place, reform in Baltimore is practically impossible. Agents of change are punished and spat out by the system. So Stringer failed at face value. He failed to change the game. And Avon knew that the game stays the game. Always. But where is Avon? He's behind a cell. Not exactly a great victory, is it? His nephew is dead, his sister doesn't speak to him, and it's implied money is drying up. The honour-bound gangster code of silence may eventually become tiring, as it did for Weebay, and Avon might just find himself years down the line on a cold winter's night during a prison lockdown thinking, just what did I do all this for? What was the point? Family? Well, like Michael Corleone before him, it was the life itself that destroyed his family, and even he himself seems to acknowledge that Stringer was right when he talks to Slim Charles, saying, That nigga String was right about this shit, man. That nigga was right. Fuck Marlowe. Fuck this fucking war. All this beef over a couple of fucking corners. But then again, maybe he was in an emotional state and would revert back to his usual self after a while, so we're back to square one. I think a narrative has taken a hold among Wire fans where we look at Stringer and point and laugh at how dumb he was, how out of his depth he was, and whilst I agree in spirit, I think it's a bit unfair, as is the constant praise Avon gets as some kind of honourable gangster just because he's so charismatic, with people conveniently sidestepping the fact that it was he who okayed the Brandon hit being done the way it was his murdering of multiple inmates just on the possibility it might reduce his sentence, and a whole lot of other things. In fact, it might be time for a why you're wrong about Avon Barksdale video. Still though, hindsight is a beautiful thing, and it was cringeworthy listening to Stringer trying to talk economic analogies to a drug kingpin, or his you a student of history lecture to Marlow when Marlow looks like he's holding himself back from trying to eat Stringer's face. Getting rain made by Clay Davis was embarrassing and is often used as the example as to why Stringer was never cut out for the legitimate world. But let's take a step back here. Even Carchetti was scammed by Davis. This was a learning experience for Stringer which would make him a better businessman. Most businesses lose money in their first year. He was smarter than most other guys in the room, but not as smart as he thought he was, which was one of his key flaws, represented by his A- test score. But smart he was, smart enough to play a part in gathering the gangs who have been fighting for years and unite them until Avon came back with his I want my corners mantra. His pragmatism also kept the Barksdales afloat during season 2 while Avon struggled to find a wholesaler. So I don't think we should dismiss Stringer. Plus he had the harder task, he had to sell foreign ideas, ideas his own people didn't buy as shown when Poot sees the muscles shaking his head during Stringer's speech. It takes more than one person and a lot of time to change company culture and spearhead revolutionary ideas. He stepped out of his comfort zone. Avon, on the other hand, was preaching the status quo. West side, fuck yeah. And also, Stringer may have had the ideas, but he lacked the skills to communicate them to his people. So his people never fully knew the benefits of the new ways because he couldn't fucking sell it. When Poot, for example, brings up that they're gonna look like some punk ass bitches, which is a legitimate criticism, even a low level guy like Poot understood a vital element of the game was street rep. Stringer resorts to his hood like nature and starts screaming at Poot, undermining him instead of addressing his criticism. He does this throughout the show, bringing the business mentality to the streets and the street mentality to the business. Forgive me, but you still showing a little bit of that street corner mentality. With disastrous results. A key example being when he wanted to whack a state senator. How could he not see that was a bad idea? Ironically for a businessman, he took things too personally. Carchetti recognised that the game is the game, that she it happens. He didn't try to whack Clay, he didn't try to send him to prison, and he ended up one of the winners of the show. 
I think it would be an interesting question, this video, to pose before you saw season 3 play out. Hindsight is a beautiful thing and we laugh at Stringer now, but how many of us bought his vision and were, along with Stringer, frustrated initially when Avon came back and started to mess things up when he got out? I think the first time you watch The Wire, you think Stringer is right. The second time you watch it, you side with Avon and think he was right. And the third time, you realise they were both right and both wrong. In other words, they had the perfect complementary system of doing things with both men's strengths being the backbone over the organisation. But once they were apart, their flaws came to the forefront. Avon was correct in that street rep counts, it means something and has tangible value, but he romanticised the streets too much, which held him back. Stringer, as we know, was so focused on taking the organisation legit that he went into a world way past where his ability was at. Avon screwed up the new ways and stopped the Barksdales progressing by bringing the bodies and heat, and Stringer messed with the old ways and destroyed the Barksdales from the inside by going against the values of the game, breaking the Sunday truce, snitching on Avon, all of that kind of stuff. A combination of both may have been the best thing, but the fractures between the two were present all the way back in Season 1, as I mentioned in the other video on Stringer and Avon. But in a perfect world, the Barksdales could have moved forward with Stringer's ideals, which would be kept in check by Avon's respect for the game and his getting rid of bad apples like Marlowe, which was really where the crux of Avon's issues was. As he says, there's always gonna be a Marlowe. No Marlowe, no game. All it takes is for one guy, one Marlowe, to screw up the New Day co-op. And screw it up royally, Avon knew that, which is why I think both men were right. Stringer's vision was one without police and violence, but when there's someone who doesn't want to conform, when there's a thug like Marlowe, then you have to go the Avon route with your grenades and AKs. Stringer made key mistakes a fully streetwise, undistracted gangster wouldn't make. The Muzon issue, not being alarmed at the huge amount of money pimpin' ass Orlando was able to front, something Avon noticed as soon as he was told. The legit world was not one he could thrive in and understand, be accepted in as he always dreamed of. He lacked the respect for the game and his huge ego was a barrier to success. Like why didn't he just go to Levy about Clay Davis like he did in the end? Ask him if this plan looked legit to him. He must have thought to himself, after a crash course in a community college, that he could do it all himself, be a game changer all on his own. Stringer had one foot in both worlds and didn't fully fit in either, as summed up perfectly by Avon. You know the difference is between me and you? I bleed red. You bleed green. What you been building for us? Huh? You know what, I look at you these days, you know what I see? I see a man without a country. Not hard enough for this right here. And maybe, just maybe, not smart enough for them out there. Avon's street instinct always trumped Stringer's education. He was right about so many things every step of the way. Stringer was bamboozled by the illegitimate world, which had even more corruption. At least the underworld knows what it is, and he didn't have the know-how how to deal with it. And Avon? He might be narrow-minded and started attracting the cops again, which pulled Daniel's detail away from Kintel Williamson and back onto him, but he knew the game was the game. He's just a gangster, I suppose. He read Marlowe when no one else could, when the co-op thought they could evolve him and bring him in, a fatal mistake for the likes of Prop Joe. I'm paraphrasing a quote from Omar, but when you run with the wolves, you have to be a wolf, not a suit-wearing businessman trying to lecture an animal like Marlowe about market business cycles. Avon knew his place, he stayed in his lane, didn't play those away games, he knows he doesn't understand that world and would get outclassed, so he doesn't even attempt to get a foothold in it. And that might make him less ambitious, it might make him narrow-minded, but it does make him smarter on a level. Humble, even. A humble motherfucker with a big-ass head. Plus, he doesn't trust the co-op, doesn't trust Prop Joe who may be using the co-op, Charlie Luciano style, to actually solidify power for himself and weaken the Barksdales, like when he threatens to kick Stringer out of the co-op after he has consolidated that power. But then again, Avon's soldier mentality is self-destructive, it's anarchic and outdated and leads to an endless cycle of violence and chaos. If Avon was in prison for 20 years not a peep, 
and came out at a time when the co-op was thriving and the new ways of doing things had settled in, he would be seen as a dinosaur, a guy like Fitch Lamana from The Sopranos. And let's not forget the co-op worked in real life, with the Italian-American Mafia Commission making the mob more organised and therefore more powerful. Just constantly warring, stagnating on the same level and not evolving can't last forever. Maybe on some deeper level, Avon knew that, knew that you can't wear the crown forever, and accepted that, hence me adding the how you never gonna be too slow speech at the beginning of this video. I mean, he seems content in prison, and for Stringer, you'd imagine prison would be absolute torture. He would see himself as being wasted in the can. But wholesaling, investing into legit business, becoming the bank, becoming untouchable by the feds, was a viable long-term plan that Avon didn't consider, and that means somewhere down the line, he would be left behind. Stringer was right that the game doesn't have to be about territory and wearing the crown, but Avon was also right that the game can't be made legit because that's the nature of the game. It's illegitimate drug dealing, and not everyone is going to play by the rules. There is something to admire in Stringer's idealistic vision, but it relies on everyone being on board and only it takes one person to screw it up. The co-op did outlast everyone though, so you could argue Stringer won. Let's give Prop Joe credit as well there. But the co-op lasts beyond season 5, and the gangsters had transformed into businessmen so well they couldn't quite work out why Marla wouldn't come on board and chose not to revert back to the old ways and kill him, thinking he'd come around which I've discussed in another video. In a way, they got so far above the game that they lost respect for it. If Stringer had lived, if he hadn't tangled himself with Muzon and Omar, if he hadn't clashed with his environment, he would probably have gone on to be a success. But that's the point. He didn't live. He got got to in the end. The streets got to him. His business acumen was only successful relative to his environment and his circumstances. If Stringer was born in a middle-class suburban family, he would probably be some kind of high-level property developer by now. And this is one of the key main points of the show, especially with season 4 with the kids and how they will end up. Randy, Michael, Naaman and the like. What if Stringer was adopted by a rich family instead of living life on the streets of Baltimore? He'd be a completely different person. I always thought that Avon knew that Stringer's plan would collapse. Little comments he makes. We take care of business string as Stringer walks in. He says it like he's talking to a child, like he's waiting for the moment where Stringer screws up and he'd be validated. That nigga took our money, man. I seen it coming. You a fucking businessman. You want to handle it like that. You don't want to get all gangster wild with it and shit, right? They saw your ghetto ass coming from miles away, nigga. You got a fucking beef with them? That shit is on you. And he can then lay it on Stringer, as he does so with the Man Without a Country speech, one of the best summaries of Stringer. Heck, Avon should be doing my job. Once Stringer moved away from the streets, he lost who he actually was, because he could never fully be a legitimate businessman. The tricks of the trade, the games and the politics were all things he was a novice with. This is an entirely different game, and he was maybe, just maybe, not smart enough for them out there. He was too much of a gangster to be a good businessman and too much of a businessman to be a good gangster, mixing the two worlds. You can legitimately blame Stringer for Avon's and the whole of the Barksdale's downfall. Stringer was also narrow-minded in his own way. But you can't fully blame Avon on Stringer's downfall. He tried to save him, to reason with Muzon. It was Stringer who screwed things up with his scheming. So all in all, Avon comes out looking better. He played the game the way it's always been played, the way he signed up to play it. He knew the rules, understood the consequences, and worked within the established framework. He didn't try to change or pretend he was something he wasn't, and that was just a straight-up gangster, for better or worse. Stringer was intelligent and educated. He also knew the game, but tried to be something he wasn't and didn't fully understand the streets. Avon, for example, would never have called the hit on D'Angelo, it goes against his entire ethos. He was a soldier who became a leader. He was hard, loyal, and with heart. Stringer ran the game as a business, cruel and uncompromising. Wallace and D'Angelo might flip. Who cares who they are? Who cares how young they are? How human they are? They gotta go. And the two worked well together, and from a purely business point of view, killing D'Angelo was the correct move. Although, of course, it requires the family and human element to be ignored. Avon and Stringer ended up stepping on each other's feet, dooming each other. Stringer got Avon out of the way to fix the business. 
Avon got Stringer out of the way to protect his rep. There's something ironic about String killing D'Angelo being business over family, and Avon returning the favour by letting Muzon take out Stringer, which was also business over family. Stringer wasn't a weakling. He'd made his bones. He didn't avoid taking part in the Barksdale Stanfield War out of weakness or anything. He just didn't believe that was the way forward. Likewise, Avon wasn't just a rough and tumble individual, a red blooded maniac who lunged for his pistol at the first chance. He was intelligent and had a heart. The fact that we are even discussing who won between them showcases that they were idealistically at war with each other. They had drifted apart and no longer saw eye to eye. And that's the real failing. There's a tragedy here, a story of two brothers who came up together to create an empire, and they were eventually the cause for each other's downfall, losing each other while they chased their dreams. They didn't lose because of Marlowe, fuck Marlowe. They didn't lose because of the police, fuck the police. They lost because of each other. So there you have it, that's my take on the Avon Stringer debate. What are your thoughts on it? Let me know in the comment section below. Subscribe to the channel and thanks for watching.